What does it mean? What does it mean? Just what exactly is Jack Skellington testing for in all the stolen Christmas bric-a-brac? Yes, I know Christmas, but confound it all, what exactly in the experiments he sets up is he looking for in the real world sense? Simple montage, nothing more, or something bigger at its core. It's been buzzing in my skull for far too long, so I had to know. What is he doing? What is he doing? And most importantly, why were his experiments doomed to fail from the very start? In The Nightmare Before Christmas, Jack Skellington sets out to determine what makes Christmas Christmas using the scientific method. Dr. Finkelstein lends Jack various laboratory equipment, like a microscope, test tube beakers, and whatever else he was able to shove in his bag that's obviously connected to another dimension because there's no way all that fit in there and didn't break. I mean, glass beakers and test tubes bouncing around in a bag? No way those survived intact. Aside from the fact that you can't determine the components that make up Christmas using steam, Jack seems to be one of those friends who has no idea what they're doing with your very precious possessions. I guess being Pumpkin King has its perks, though. To further investigate this, we'll be getting a little extra science today, using a little scientific method of our own, and starting in Halloween Town and ending up somewhere in crime scene and forensic sciences. So put your lab goggles on and actually button up your lab coat for today's scientifically magical dive. Let's start with Jack's first experiment, looking at a hollyberry using a microscope. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a science class where you had to make a wet mount slide out of onion skin in order to see the plant cell walls, but it seems Jack never did. For those of you who aren't familiar with the concept, a wet mount is a quick way to take a thin or small specimen and examine it closely under a microscope, say the very thin skin of an onion or a couple drops of pond water to see microorganisms swimming around. You take a glass slide, place your specimen atop it, add a few drops of water, and complete the microscopic sandwich with a thin, sometimes shorter, glass cover slip. With this process in mind, let's try to roughly apply this to a hollyberry in the real world first. Maybe you managed to get a very thin layer of skin off the berry. You would take that, carefully lay it on your slide, add a couple of drops of water, and then cover it with the cover slip. This is a temporary use slide as the water will eventually dry out due to evaporation, but you could potentially see the cell walls that make up the hollyberry, which, while very cool, is ultimately unhelpful if you're trying to understand the magic of a holiday at a microscopic level, in the real world anyway. I'd give Jack the benefit of the doubt in finding this holiday magic in cell walls if he didn't do what would make every single person who has ever professionally used a microscope cringe. Jack put a whole specimen on a microscope slide, and then proceeded to zoom in, and in, and then started to squish the hollyberry, which when you get anywhere near a microscope slide, you should know to back off. Unless you're using an oil immersion lens with oil on your slide, which is not the case here, because scientists know that if you touch that slide, you can damage your objective lens, which is the magnification lens on the bottom of the microscope. Kind of a big deal. So the fact that Jack touched the hollyberry at all was a big Christmas red stop sign. But Jack continued until he squished the berry and cracked the slide. Oh, shivers. Which is definitely a big no when working with microscopes if you ever want them to work again. Big fail. RIP Dr. Finkelstein's microscope. Failed. Okay, so Jack failed at biology. Maybe he fared better at chemistry. Narrator, he most definitely did not. Admittedly, I have no clue what's in the vat that Jack drops the candy cane into and then proceeds to electrocute, but let's just assume it's water. Those in the know know that candy canes are just pure sugar and food dye. You'd think the Pumpkin King, coming from a holiday land where candy is super popular for trick-or-treaters, would be able to recognize this, but alas for poor old Jack. Anyway, if you put sugar into water, it just dissolves. Possibly, Jack even used electricity to heat the water, which would only make the candy cane dissolve faster and not turn into a limp spaghetti noodle. Failed. But, 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 but. In the interest of science, I was wondering what would make a candy cane be able to change shape. Turns out, if you heat a candy cane at a low temperature, somewhere around 250 degrees Fahrenheit, in a pan in the oven for a few minutes, the bonds between the sugar crystals that make up the typical candy cane structure will weaken with heat, allowing you to carefully twist the candy cane into a different shape. As it cools, the candy cane will stay in its new shape because the bonds will reform in the absence of heat. If you'd like to take a crack at this little experiment, do be sure to use wax paper so the candy cane doesn't stick to your pan. 
Unfortunately for the residents of Halloween Town and probably the holidays at large, Jack only had one other big experiment, crushing a glass ornament and putting it into a bubbling beaker of unknown clear liquid, maybe ectoplasm? Anyway, it gives off a pulsing green glow. Interesting reaction, but what does it mean? Well, in theory, it's an oscillating chemiluminescence reaction, but that would have been impossible given what he actually added. Chemiluminescence is a fancy science word for the emission of light in a chemical reaction. Simply-ish stated, chemiluminescence is when two compounds enter an excited, high-energy state where an electron is bumped from a lower energy level to a higher one. But atoms don't like having extra electrons, so they want to get rid of them. In the process of chemiluminescence, they release that extra energy in the form of a photon, or light. If the light is emitted in a visible wavelength somewhere between 400 and 700 nanometers, we see a visible flash when the atom lets go of its extra electron. There are different kinds of chemiluminescence reactions based on what's involved. One interesting chemiluminescence reaction is mixing luminol with hydrogen peroxide, which forms a blue light. Ooh. Luminol is actually a compound made of hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon used by forensic investigators to detect trace amounts of blood at crime scenes because it reacts with the iron in the hemoglobin, which is the protein found in red blood cells. They mix the luminol powder with a liquid containing hydrogen peroxide, a hydroxide, and some other chemicals. Then they put the liquid in a spray bottle. The luminol and hydrogen peroxide are the compounds that are actually creating the chemical reaction, but in order to produce a strong glow, a catalyst is needed to accelerate the process, which in this case is iron from the hemoglobin. Chemiluminescence can also be seen in some living organisms, where it's referred to as bioluminescence. Okay, but that was just regular chemiluminescence. What's happening in Jack's experiment is an oscillating reaction where the components in the reaction fluctuate, going from A to B and then A to B again and repeat. A more commonly known oscillating reaction, the briggs rosser oscillating reaction, oscillates from a clear solution to blue, then light yellow, and clear again. But Jack's experiment appears to do that too, not just flashing once, but pulsing a green glow. Ooh. Luminol can be used in an oscillating reaction, giving off blue pulses, but we saw that it would need a lot of other chemicals for the reaction to occur in the first place. Not really sure of anything that would have been in a Christmas ornament to cause chemiluminescence, let alone an oscillating chemiluminescence reaction. Failed. Or did Jack actually succeed, finding a magic that cannot be explained away by mortal sciences? Was a holiday spirit or magic in that ornament after all? What does it mean? And so we find ourselves, as Jack did, no closer to figuring out what makes Christmas Christmas. Which makes total sense because the holiday spirit isn't something you can test. It's invisible but everywhere. Just because we cannot see it doesn't mean we can't believe it, after all. Like Jack, I overanalyzed an obsession of my own and came out with a deeper understanding of what the science experiments performed could have tested for. I personally think Jack was onto something with his spider snowflakes, they were the coolest. But what is your favorite experiment in Jack's obsession? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you, friends and fiends, for tuning in to make sense of the magical. Do be sure to like and subscribe so you won't miss the next creepy and spooky video. See you soon. Goodbye.